first of all, let's consider the world that we live in today and how it was affected by the events of 1519 to 1521. What happened between 1519 and 1521 was that 490 Spaniards in 11 ships turned up on the coast of Mexico and within two years utterly destroyed the Aztec Empire, uh, which could put 200,000 men uh, into the field, and which was itself a highly militaristic empire. One, one has to wonder how that could have happened. Um, and and it, it's an extraordinary event. Now, when I look at the encounter of those two cultures, what I see is an incredible opportunity lost. There was so, this was a moment, it was a precious moment in human history when the cultures of Europe and the cultures of the New World could have learned so much from one another. If they had come together in a spirit of love, in a spirit of mutual tolerance, in a spirit of respect, and each tried to learn what was good in the other culture and to grow from that, the whole world that we live in today would be completely different. So many things came from those wicked two years of the Spanish conquest of Mexico. The whole genocide of the Native American peoples that followed that, the whole issue in North America and South America too, Mexico's there in the center, but, but within less than 15 years of the Spanish conquest of Mexico, we have the Spanish conquest of Peru carried out by Pizarro on exactly the model that Cortes applied uh, in, in, in Mexico. We have the um, mass burning and destruction of uh, the ancient documents of these cultures, whether it's the quipu of the Maya or whether it's the codices, sorry, the quipu of the, of the uh, Inca uh, or the codices of the Maya. Uh, thousands and thousands of Mayan documents. We do not know what Is those... mainly oral uh, tradition? No, the Maya had huge quantities of written documents. Mm. And we don't know what was in those written documents. We actually don't know. There might, there might be crucial keys to our survival as a species that were just piled up into bonfires and burnt by the ignorant, bigoted, wicked-minded priests of the Spaniards, utterly destroying a vast human heritage. Was, this was a terrible, terrible moment in, in human history. And I can't help feeling that behind it, operating behind it, uh, were supernatural forces. Well, I use the word supernatural simply because it is the conventional wor word. I, 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 actually, it's probably the wrong word to use. I think we should just say that reality is much bigger than we imagine and that our focus is on a tiny slice of it, but we are affected by all of it. Uh, and, and things are going on at the level of reality, uh, which we're not fully getting to grips with. And one of those is the influence, and again, I use terms of duality, of evil and good on human choices. I think it's, uh, to set this in context, um, it, I, I always find it useful to refer to a particular ancient teaching, which is the teaching known as Gnosticism. Um, and arguably, the first Christians were Gnostics. They were not people who had hierarchical priesthoods who told them what to believe spiritually. They were people who embraced direct spiritual experience and a kind of revelatory gnosis mm. that, came, that came from that experience. But pretty soon, within Christianity, by about 300 years in to the Christian experiment, uh, a very literal-minded faction had taken over, which became the Roman Catholic Church, and which went into an alliance with the state of Rome, uh, and which became a violently oppressive, militant, crusading religion. Uh, and which the first thing it did was to stamp out Gnosticism. And the Gnostics were amongst the first to be burnt at the stake, the first of many to be burnt at the stake in the name of God by the church. Now, the thing about the Gnostics was, was that they were dualists. They saw very much in terms of dark and light, good and evil, love and fear. And they saw that there was something that they called God, the plerima, the all, the totality, but that within it were these two realms of light and dark. 
And it's a very long and complicated philosophy to explain fully, but they suggested that the material realm was as a result of a, an error or a, a, a mistake in the pleroma, and that, uh, that a, a, a fallen entity had created another entity they call the Demiurge, who in turn had created the world and human beings. Mm. From the Gnostic point of view, this is why they got burnt at the stake. From the Gnostic point of view, the entity that we in the West, and indeed it's not just us in the West, because Christianity, Judaism, and Islam all worship the same God. You might call him Allah, might call him Jehovah, might call him God, but actually it's all the same God. Uh, unites the three monotheistic faiths. From the Gnostic point of view, that entity isn't God at all. That entity is an imposter. That entity is, if you like, a demon, um, a, 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 a kind of inferior supernatural who has a huge ego, is in intensely jealous, um, is vi filled with violent urges, and forces these upon mankind and persuades mankind to worship and adore him. This is the Demiurge, the, ent the entity that we call Jehovah. For the Gnostics, he was a demon, posing, posturing as God and leading mankind astray with uh, evil angels called archons who played with the human mind and tempted us down wicked and evil paths, every choice that we make drawing us further into darkness and preventing us from realizing the crucial aspect of ourselves, which is the divine spark within us, mm -hmm. that we have a divine spark within us, that it is there, that is fundamental to us. And the whole project of the Demiurge and the Archons in the Gnostic scheme of things is to prevent us from realizing that divine spark and to keep us shut in, locked into matter and into the material realm and not recognizing the spirit within us mm. um, and and for the serpent huh? the way how it, the serpent actually I'm having my serpent dress was was misinterpreted on huh? the Mexicans actually well, well exactly and again I mean that not are some of the the false uh, things that we have learned from history yeah. but are actually not the, misled we're being misled totally misled and the Gnostics make this very clear they they invert the Garden of Eden story so in the Garden of Eden from the Gnostic point of view the serpent is the good guy mm. not the bad guy the serpent is saying to Adam and Eve you need to have knowledge of good and evil. You can't remain in pristine ignorance. You have to have knowledge of good and evil, and you will grow through the choices that you make. And that's what, what the, the tree of life is. It's, the, it's, it's not the tree of life, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Mm -hmm. And then God gets really upset and angry. And, and uh, it, the passage in Genesis is really quite intriguing because God says, so-called God, who the Gnostics believed was a demon, said, if they eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, next thing they will eat of the tree of life, and then they will become like us, plural, like us. What did he mean? What did the entity mean by that? that and so Adam and Eve are driven out of the garden and, and never allowed to explore further. And we're plunged into a life of constant distraction and toil where we cannot uh, easily recognize the spiritual dimension in ourselves. And actually, this is where Gnosticism a crushed, destroyed, damaged, persecuted system of ideas connects up with shamanism in the, in the Amazon jungle. Because when I talk to shamans in the Amazon jungle about the problems with Western technological society, they say it's very, very simple. You have severed your connection with spirit. If you do not reconnect with spirit, then huge disasters are going to befall you and us because of you. Mm. You have to reconnect with spirit. And they, they see ayahuasca as a, perhaps a tough remedy, but a way to help us to reconnect with spirit, which otherwise might be very difficult for us, for us to do. So to come back to this issue of what happened in Mexico between 1519 and 1521, the idea that I'm playing with in this story mm -hmm. is that the same demon who appears to Moctezuma as the war god of the Aztecs, whose name was Huitzilopochtli, which means hummingbird at the left hand of the sun, that that same demon appeared to Cortes, the Spanish conquistador, in the disguise of Saint Peter. And that the purpose of demons down through the ages has been to multiply human misery and to prevent us from recognizing the divine spark in ourselves. And so this demonic entity appearing to Cortes as St. Peter, appearing to uh, Montezuma as the war god, is playing these two men like puppets and leading them into a, a gigantic 
conflagration, the consequences of which will contaminate human history for centuries to come. This is what's at the heart of the story, and I think it's, a, it's an interesting idea to, ex to explore, particularly since history tells us that Cortes did have visionary encounters with an entity that he believed was St. Peter. Uh, in fact, since his childhood, he'd felt that St. Peter was his patron saint who had uh, saved him from a terminal illness in childhood. And we know that Moctezuma regularly had conversations with the entity that he believed was hummingbird, Huitzilopochtli, mm -hmm. and that he used psilocybin mushrooms in order to have those conversations. And what that entity told him to do was terrible things, terrible things, to sacrifice human beings, to offer up their hearts and blood to the war god. Then the war god would save him from the coming disaster, and Moctezuma believed that and made things just worse and worse and worse and worse and worse all the all the time so in a novel i can i can m make these encounters between the war god and and i can dramatize them the, the, the war god becomes a character in the novel saint peter he's not saint peter he's a he's a uh, a demon posing, disguising himself as St. Peter, becomes a character in the novel. And, and it's possible to explore the temptation that leads these two men down a course that will really and truly infect human history right through until today. It was a pivotal moment. It was a turning point. See, for example, why did 490 Spaniards manage to defeat this giant military empire? And the Aztecs were a military power. They were highly organized. They had a secret police force. They thrived on terrorism. They terrorized their own people. And at the apex of this system of terror sat Moctezuma, the emperor of the Aztecs. They terrorized neighboring peoples. They preyed upon neighboring peoples to take from them young men and women who they would then sacrifice on their pyramid by, by cutting out their hearts. We're not talking of uh, Mayans. And when I was in Yucatan, we actually t it was all about the Mayans. So what is the difference well, with the Aztec Mayans? The Maya were the first people that Cortes in encountered. Cortes first landed on the island that we know as Cozumel today, which mm -hmm. is a holiday resort. Mm -hmm. And then he went down from there to the Tabasco River, where he had a huge battle with the Mayans, which he, which he won. Um, the, uh, the Mayas are a distinct people from the Aztecs. And the proper name for the Aztecs, by the way, is I, I call them Aztecs because that is the most familiar name today, but it's really Mexica. And from their name, we get the name Mexico, M-E-X-I-C-O. That, that, that's the origin of the name Mexico. Uh, the, the Aztecs were a young civilization. They had been a wandering nomadic people, very ferocious, until about 1300 after Christ. And then they settled in the area of the Valley of Mexico, and gradually they overcame all neighboring peoples, and they believed themselves to be led by their god of war, um, who demanded human sacrifice as the price for their success. And they offered those sacrifices to him. Um, the Maya were a much older culture. They, uh, they had been present in, mainly in the Yucatan and in Guatemala, neighboring country to Mexico, uh, for at least two to 3,000 years uh, before the time of the conquest. Uh, they, they certainly go back, the, the early, what is called the classic Maya period, certainly goes back to 200, 300, 400 years before Christ, and you can trace the antecedents of that back much further to a culture called the Olmecs. So they were rather an ancient culture, inheriting even older ideas. Uh, they were certainly a high civilization. They were a Stone Age culture. Neither the Aztecs or the Maya uh, used metal weapons. They had some small amount of copper, um, which was very soft and not suitable for, for use as a weapon. Their, their technology at that level was quite limited. They used, they used obsidian and flint uh, for, for their weapons, which, of course, put them at a disadvantage against a culture which used metal weapons and, indeed, guns, as the, as the Spanish did. So they were both Stone Age cultures, but in many ways the Maya reached a very high level of civilization. Which the some people say they've actually didn't even there was they they disappeared as a civilization, meaning well, they, they had some technology. Well, the civilization disappeared, but the Maya did not, because the Yucatan and Guatemala and large parts of Mexico are still full of Mayan speakers to this day. The Maya are still there, but but their their high civilization, which sort of reached its pinnacle about two thousand years ago, and and then went into a slow decline over the following eight hundred years, and finally just blinked out and ceased to be a civilization, um, was, was in many ways very remarkable. Uh, everybody's heard of the Mayan calendar. 
uh, which never did predict the end of the world on the 21st of December 2012, but did predict the end of a great cycle of the human story and the beginning of another one on the 21st of December 2012. Now, the Mayan calendar is quite an amazing piece of science. It's got a better estimate of the length of the solar year than we use in the Western calendar today. Um, we're using the Mayan calendar, you could accurately predict the phase of the moon on a Monday, the 5th of February, 5,000 years from now. Or you could go back five or even 10,000 years and choose a particular day and say exactly where the moon would be at that time. They, they, the, 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 it was based on really amazingly precise and perfect long-term observations of the heavens. They really understood the celestial motions mm. and expressed them in a, in a calendar. Um, great astronomers. Also. Great astronomers and, and fantastic architects as well. The, the places like uh, Tikal, uh, Palenque, mm. you know, the, the, the Maya created most extraordinary sacred ceremonial sites. Mm. They were not in their highly evolved state big sacrifices of human beings. They did carry out some human sacrifice, and some human sacrifice is a really bad thing to do. But they didn't carry it out on the industrial scale that the later Aztecs did. The Aztecs, uh, when they inaugurated their uh, great pyramid in Tenochtitlan, which was their capital city, which is now the heart of modern Mexico City, they murdered 80,000 people. That's 880,000 people. It took them four days and teams of killers working round the clock to murder 80,000 people, cut out their hearts so that the streets of the city were knee deep in blood. The Maya never carried out human sacrifice on that scale, but to carry out human sacrifice at all is an, an act of terrible wickedness. While I say that, let us immediately note that the Spanish of that period burned people at the stake in honor of their god. And I see no difference between cutting somebody's heart out on a pyramid and burning somebody at the stake in the name of God. What the Spanish were doing was also human sacrifice. They just dressed it up in a different way, but burning somebody at the stake is undoubtedly uh, a ritual of human sacrifice, which Christian peoples con continued to perform until the early 1700s. Um, th so, so when Cortes landed in 1519, the first people he encountered were the Maya, but not the highly civilized Maya of the time of Christ. The Maya he encountered were already a fallen people. Um, and, and they did have large numbers of, of warriors, but, but Cortes was able to mm. defeat them. And he, he defeated an army of 40,000 Maya with 490 men. Well, he had cavalry. He had 16 cavalry. The cavalry were dressed up in uh, metal armor, shining metal armor. Um, horses had not been seen in the New World for 12,000 years. Nobody knew what these things were. The, the last horse went extinct 12,000 years before. But to, to, to see 16 heavy horse with shining armor, with men sitting on their backs, charging down at you at 30 miles an hour with the ground thundering beneath their feet was a truly terrifying experience for the Maya. And they couldn't understand what these things were. They, they thought they were supernatural beings. They thought it was some kind of hybrid of, of man and deer. That's how they described them. And then the Spanish used dogs as a weapon of war. They, um, they had uh, mastiffs and wolfhounds, which were trained to relish human flesh and which they also dressed up in armor. Uh, the Maya had dogs too. They had, you know, chihuahuas, and, um, and they used them as a food item. They, they, they didn't know what these things were, and then the Spanish had guns, they had swords of Toledo steel, they had extraordinary military discipline. So that's how Cortes won his, won his first battle. But Cortes would never have defeated the Aztecs if the Aztecs had had a different character as a culture. The reason Cortes was able to defeat the huge military force of the Aztecs was because the Aztecs had made all their own neighbors hate them. The Aztecs had so terrorized their neighbors. Had not, if the Aztecs had practiced a system based on love, Cortes could never have conquered Mexico. The Aztecs practiced a system based on fear and terror. Mm -hmm. And therefore, Cortes was able to get the support of local tribes to overthrow the Aztecs. Mm -hmm. So in a way, the Aztecs created their own karma by their own cruelty and wickedness and by their own choices. Mm -hmm.
not being an historian myself, I'm very, uh, very excited to have a conversation with you and have some parts of the story. There's still this thing about the, the alignment of the stars and, yes. and all those pyramids that are not even found in Mexico. Yes. You have looked at the Sphinx and, and many other pyramids yeah. in Giza and all of that. What do you find is the parallel? Why, why are those pyramids put in such a position to, to, do, to do what on this earth? What does, what does uh, Ayahuasca told you? <laughs> not, uh, not so much uh, Ayahuasca. Um, and, and now that you just brought to my mind something else that I that I that you asked me earlier and I didn't pick up on, I'll come back to the stars in a minute. Okay. But um, I've ex I've talked to you about ayahuasca as a teacher. Um, I've received important teachings from ayahuasca, which we can go into or not, as you wish. Um, but I, I've talked to to you about ayahuasca as revealing a, a, a wider and normally unseen reality. But there's something else ayahuasca does, and that is um, it seems to serve as a, as a creative impulse or a creative boost. And it's done this with many artists. Uh, for example, Alex Gray uh, in the United States or, or Martina Hoffman um, from Boulder, Colorado, uh, and Robert Venosa recently died, unfortunately, a brilliant, brilliant artist, uh, artist Robert Venosa. Uh, these three artists who I've mentioned, Robert Venosa, uh, Alex Gray and Martina Hoffman, have all worked with ayahuasca. And ayahuasca has transformed the kind of art they do. It's very noticeable, and it's a phenomenon all around the world with artists who've worked with ayahuasca. It's a new kind of art is being produced, and this art is very powerful uh, and, and extraordinary, uh, extraordinarily vi visual and, and experiential to, to go into. Um, in my case, I don't paint, you know. I can't draw anything. But I do write, mm -hmm. and th I have absolutely no doubt that it was my encounters with ayahuasca which gave me the creative urge, um, the creative impulse to start writing novels mm -hmm. after decades of writing uh, only nonfiction. Mm -hmm. But ayahuasca has not um, really given me Yes, entanglement actually is yeah, one of your books. That was the, you, you a tangle that you f you, you received huh, during I, a trip. I received it. I went to Brazil in two thousand and seven, which has become a regular pilgrimage for me to drink ayahuasca once a year. I have five sessions. I don't do, do it do it more than that. I find that you know you have to brace yourself for ayahuasca. Ayahuasca is not easy. It's very hard work. Nobody's doing this for fun. Um, it's a, it's a, it's 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 an emotional and physical ordeal and a spiritual ordeal as well. The, I mean, some people have the the idea that you you might get addicted to ayahuasca. Quite the opposite, mm -hmm. quite the opposite. It, you really have to prepare yourself and 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 mentally brace yourself for what you're going to experience. But I I do go to Brazil once a year. I have five sessions because I feel that I learn from them and that they're important to me and they've helped me to become a more adjusted and I hope more nurturing and more love-giving personality than I used to be. I, I've had a lot of lessons in that respect. Uh, but that time when I went down to Brazil, I went with the specific intention of asking Ayahuasca, um, can I write fiction? And um, if I were to write fiction, what would what would I write a, a novel about? I had, of course, a, a maelstrom of different ideas floating around, but the one idea I didn't have was to write a novel about two young women, one who lived 24,000 years ago in the Stone Age and one who lived today, whose lives were entangled in the mystery of time by an angel. Uh, I call her the Blue Angel, um, who brings together these two young women because in the, the scheme of things that I present in Entangled, time is not an arrow from past through present to future in a straight line, but rather an intertwined, entangled, spiraling cat's cradle of lines which cross and intersect. And uh, the, the Blue Angel brings together Rhea from the Stone Age and Leone from modern Los Angeles uh, to do battle with a demon who travels through time. This was the story. They connect through the dream state or in they, the they time? They connect in altered states of consciousness. Mm -hmm. they, they have to enter an altered state of consciousness. Dreams do play a part in the story, but so does DMT and ayahuasca and psilocybin mushrooms in the case of the Stone Age character. And we know for sure that our Stone Age ancestors 
did use psilocybin mushrooms, uh, and and this has been absolutely definitively proved in recent years. So, I, some somewhat based on history, but the the basic story, the characters, the dilemma, the whole issue of time, uh, the the time shift that t- that takes place, the interconnection of these two characters across different periods of time, all of that came to me in a series of ayahuasca visions, together with a very strong impulse to go home and start writing, which is, uh, which, which is exactly what I did. So, so having, pyramids. Ta- having <laughs> taken that little diversion, yes, I was given a story, and I, w- and I was given uh, a strong new creative impulse in my life, which I am very much fulfilled by and enjoying exploring. Um, what I've not been given by ayahuasca um, is, uh, is any further specific insight into the mystery you raise, which is why all around the world we find monumental complexes which mirror the patterns of stars uh, in the heavens. Perhaps I should ask Ayahuasca that question. I have, not, I have not actually done so. And part of the reason I haven't done so is because in my own research and my own writings over the last 20 or 25 years, I think I've gone quite deeply into that mystery already. Um, and working with uh, Robert Boval, for example, a close friend of mine who I've co-authored a number of books with and who is um, just very brilliant with uh, astronomy and with, um, with archaeoastronomy. Uh, so the, 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 the revelation that, that Robert, first of all, cracked this ancient code with his book, The Orion Mystery, which was published, an amazing book, which was published in 1994, which, uh, which shows that the three stars of the belt of the constellation of Orion appear to be mirrored on the ground by the three great pyramids of Giza, and that this can hardly be an accident when we remember that the ancient Egyptians visualized the constellation of Orion as their god, Osiris. It's not just some random constellation. It's the most important constellation in the sky for the ancient Egyptians that is mapped on the ground in the form of the three great pyramids. Then Robert and I went on in 1996. I wrote, published Fingerprints of the Gods in 1995. Then we went on together to publish in 1996 a book called Keeper of Genesis, which is called The Message of the Sphinx in the United States. And, and in that, we show that, that something really extraordinary has been done at Giza, that when people have an intuition that the, the Giza site in Egypt is a very special place, they're absolutely right. Um, because with modern computer software, we can look at the ancient skies visually. We can, we can recreate them on our computer screen. There's a wobble on the axis of the Earth uh, called... Uh, pre- it's, it's, it's the precessional wobble, rather like a top that's slowing down. Wobbles a bit like that. And right now, our North Pole points at a star called Polaris. That's our pole star. But over a period of just under 26,000 years, that axis of the Earth will make a great circle in the heavens like that. And it will point at empty space and at other different stars. Absolutely no doubt that this happens. Exactly what's causing it remains to be settled. There's a whole other argument that we may be locked in a binary system with another star, that our sun is orbiting another star, this would have the same observable effect in the heavens as this circle in the sky. Um, It's observable at the pole star, and it's observable on the horizon, particularly at the equinoxes, particularly involving the constellations of the zodiac. Um, Long been thought that the constellation in which the sun rose at dawn on the spring equinox defined the character of the age. So, and many people are surely aware of this, that it's not an accident that the early Christians used the fish as their symbol. Because for about the last 2,000 years, if you stand and look due east towards a perfectly flat horizon, about an hour before dawn on the spring equinox, the day when night and day are of equal length, 21st of March, in our calendar, you will see the constellation of Pisces, the fish, lying on the horizon in the place where the sun will then rise. But Pisces is not fixed in that place forever. This wobble on the axis of the Earth, if that's what's causing the procession, this wobble on the axis of the Earth is gradually shifting Pisces away from the house of the sun on the spring equinox and putting, we all heard the song, we live in the dawning of the age of Aquarius, 
putting the constellation of Aquarius there, where the sun rises at dawn on the spring equinox. If you go back further before the Christian times, why was it that the, the Bible is so full, the Old Testament is so full of rams? You know, rams are being sacrificed. The ram is the key figure of, uh, in ancient Egypt as well, at the Temple of Karnak in, in Luxor, in Upper Egypt. Lines of ram-headed uh, sphinxes are, are seen. Um, the constellation of Aries housed the sun in that period. Before that, it was Taurus, the bull. We have the, the Apis bull cult of ancient Egypt, which originates during the age of Taurus. Um, the ancients paid great attention to this. Now, the mystery of Giza, if you use computer software to simulate these precessional changes in the sky, remember, the Earth is the viewing platform from which we observe the stars, so movements of the Earth affect the appearance of the stars and their actual location at particular seasons of the year. If you use software to simulate the ancient skies, you discover if you go back very, very far, if you go back 12 and a half thousand years, certainly to the epoch between 12,000 and 13,000 years ago, that there's an incredible match between the sky above Giza and the monuments that we now see on the ground at, me, at Giza. You have a lion, a sphinx, gazing due east at the equinox. Then it's the constellation of Leo, which is sitting on the horizon at the equinox. And at the moment that the sun strikes the horizon at dawn on the 21st of March, due south, perfectly due south, is the constellation of Orion with its three belt stars in exactly the pattern of the three pyramids. Even the Milky Way is mirrored by the River Nile at that time. Now, I'm obviously not claiming that whoever made this incredible diagram on the ground you know, put the Nile River there. But I am suggesting that that was one of the reasons that that site was chosen, um, because it was possible to use it to create a perfect replica as above, so below, a perfect replica of the sky at a very remote epoch that we would call, to split the difference between 12,000 and 13,000 years ago, we would call 12 and a half thousand years ago, 10,500 BC, a perfect replica of that sky on the ground, in the form of the pyramids, the Sphinx, the River Nile. It's more complicated than that, but that, that's broadly what it's about. And this, of course, conflicts with the notion that the pyramids and the Sphinx were built in 2500 BC, four and a half thousand years ago. <clears throat> You'd have to be astronomically illiterate to build an equinoctial marker in the form of a lion in 2500 BC, because that was the age of Taurus. If you wanted something to point at the equinox, you should build it in the shape of a bull, then not in the shape of a lion. And it raises huge question marks over the dating of the whole, of the whole site. It seems to me, and this is, this is the conclusion I've come to, that, that an enormous effort is being made to draw our attention to that epoch. Uh, to that time that we call in our, our calendar between 12,000 and 13,000 years ago. And it's being done using a universal language of symbolism, astronomy, and architecture. That only some people could actually see or well, with some knowledge. Well, you, need to have a certain, you need to have a certain level of knowledge. You need, to, you need to be observing the stars. You need to be able to do some math if you don't have computers uh, to, to, to get this. Uh, but what the great advantage of that language is that it is universal and it is derived from observable events. If you write down your message in a script 12,000 years ago, you can't guarantee that anybody will be able to read your script in 12,000 years' time or even that the thing you wrote it on will still exist. Better to go for something on a very large scale in gigantic architecture uh, which relates to a universal motion of the heavens, which can be worked out and decoded. And then what that message seems to be saying is pay attention to the period between 12 and 13,000 years ago. And there's a weird, um, there's a weird echo uh, in the skies of today. Then it's Leo rising at the equinox. Aquarius is setting. Both of us are Leos. <laughs> yes, are you a Leo? <laughs> yes, here's, here's to Leo. Yeah, I'm, my, my birthday is the 2nd of August. Uh, and I'm the 20th. Okay, okay. That. So there, there, we, there we are, Leos. Yes, very interesting. And I was born in the Chinese year of the tiger. Uh. So there's another curiosity. Um, but uh, the sky of 12,500 years ago 
at the equinox. Leo is rising in the east. Aquarius is setting in the west. The constellation of Orion is at its lowest point. It goes up and down like a end of a seesaw. The other side, to the north, the constellation of Draco is at its highest point. Now, 12 and a half thousand years later, which is half a precessional cycle, the whole great year, the, the thing that the ancients called the great year, the, the cycle of precession runs for 25,920 years. And 12 and a half thousand years later, half a precessional cycle on, we have Aquarius rising in the east at the equinox, Leo setting in the west, Orion is at its highest point, Draco is at its lowest point. It's like a complete flip around of the, of the sky. And, and I read that as, as a deliberate connection. They knew that would happen. And they're, they're saying something that happened then, you need to pay attention to because it can come back, it can, it can return. And I'm, I'm by no means somebody who is going around the world saying the end of the world is nigh, because I don't believe that's the case. But it is very interesting that we now know we have recent strong scientific evidence that a comet struck the Earth 12,900 years ago, exactly in that window between 12 and 13,000 years ago, and brought about radical global changes, um, very, very severe global changes. The Earth was coming out of the last ice age, and it plunged back in to a thousand-year deep freeze, which geologists call the Younger Dryas, which began more or less exactly 12,900 years ago, and which up till recently has been a very mysterious episode. We don't know why this happened. Megafauna all around the world, mam mammoths, toxodon, other, other creatures went extinct suddenly mm. at that time. And uh, until recently, we didn't know why. Now it's clear that the answer is a comet, which hit the Earth, particularly North America. It fragmented, it broke into multiple fragments. But the worst impacts were in North America, where features like the Carolina Bays are impact craters from this co comet impact. Um, and what happens when the Earth is hit by a comet is that huge quantities of dust are thrown up into the upper atmosphere, and they envelop the Earth in a cloud of dust, very thick. And that dust for a thousand years radically cut down the sun's radiation reaching the Earth and caused the thousand-year deep freeze that the geologists call the Younger Dryas. And I think, my guess is, that we lost a whole episode of the human story then. I think there was a high civilization at that time. This has been the thrust of much of my nonfiction work for many, many years, that it was brought to an end by this comet impact that there were survivors, that they settled in a number of places around the world, and they created these sky-ground diagrams to draw attention to that epoch, and perhaps to warn us that that comet, the story of that comet is not over, mm -hmm. that it could be a long-period comet, uh, which might have an orbit of 12 or 13,000 years. And the Mayans speak of this blue thing coming from the sky. Is that the Mayans or well, were, were yeah, Hopi? Yeah. I was interviewing a Hopi, yeah, exactly. Yes. Kachina, yeah. Yeah, no, there, there, is, there is all of this. Now, I don't believe that we should relate to the universe with fear and doom. I think we should, we should project out onto the universe as much positivity as we can. But we also have to be reasonable and, and, and rational. And from time to time in the history of the Earth, there have been devastating impacts with, with, with comets. And uh, this is something that we should be paying a bit more attention to mm. than we do at the moment. Mm. And nothing coming from the Mexican pyramids mirroring, because a lot of them haven't been found yet. Well, a lot have not, a lot have not been found. There are very interesting resonances between the site of Teotihuacan, um, some 35 miles north of Mexico City, the place be where men became gods. That's what Teotihuacan means, the Pyramid of the Sun, the Pyramid of the Moon, and the Pyramid of Quetzalcoatl. There are very interesting resonances between that site and the site of Giza uh, in, in Upper Egypt. And, and actually, the Aztecs, who we were talking about a little bit earlier, who were a, 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 a new and a recent culture, really, they... Um, recognized some special significance to Teotihuacan, which was already ancient and in ruins when they encountered it, but they made, they made pilgrimages there. Um, what is your last message? If you have a message, knowing all the books that you wrote and this latest one and the ayahuasca and the, all of these things, what is your message right now um, to the world and to people since 
from all around the world, people are watching. This is absolutely magnificent. I can't get over the fact that with a video, it reaches that many people it's around really, the world. It's a really good thing that we can all talk to one another in, in, in this way. For me, you ask for a message. C consciousness is key. Mm. That is what we are. Mm. We are pure consciousness. You know, We are not our knees. We are not our shoulders. We are not even our brains. We are our consciousness. Mm. And we have to pay attention to our consciousness. It is an incredible gift to be born with consciousness, to have the opportunity to make fine distinctions between right and wrong, to make choices that guide us through life. We've been given by the universe an amazing chance to be here as human beings at this time. And we should not allow ourselves to be lulled into sleep by the society we live in. We should not allow ourselves to be turned into sort of meat robots, you know, that produce and consume endlessly and see nothing beyond. We should recognize the light of spirit within ourselves and we should do everything possible to nurture it and to help it to grow. Thank you, Graham. I really enjoyed this conversation and I know everybody that has been watching this video. Also, if you have been watching it to the end, I know you loved it, so please share it. And uh, thank you so much. Very delicious moment. Thank you. A delight to be here. Thank you very much. Big kisses, my beautiful co-creators. Thank you for your support and your love. I love you so much. Big, big kisses from London. Bye-bye.